Well, good morning. Wow. Got one. Jeez. Y'all need to wake up. Good morning. If you were, weren't here right at the very beginning, my name is Pastor Justin. Uh, we are kicking off a brand new eight-week sermon series called The Best Sermon Ever. And the good news is this is not me being arrogant. Um, this is a sermon from Jesus that we're going to be looking at and we're going to be diving into. And uh, there's, there's eight truths that he's going to lay out that seem very countercultural to us, that seem very backwards to us. And that's why we're going to dive into this and see what this is all about. And uh, today, as we kick this off, I want to start by telling you um, a little story from my past. Um, when I was in high school, a man came to our church. I, I grew up in Fort Myers, Florida. And, and a man came to our church from the Dominican Republic. And he said, hey, there's this woman in Santiago, Dominican Republic. She's a nurse. And um, she has taken in all these kids off the street that are illegitimate. And she's teaching them. And we said, okay, tell us more about this. And she said, in the Dominican Republic, if you are born to an unwed couple, they won't give you a birth certificate. And without a birth certificate, you're not allowed to go to school. And so what's happening is all the prostitutes' kids are running the streets. And they have nowhere to go. And they have no one at home. And they have no one to take care of them. And so this nurse has started a school in her house with her daughters. They're feeding them one meal a day. And they're, they're educating them. And we said, that's something we want to help with. And so we went down. Um, and we, we every year for, for four years in a row, I got to be a part of this. We went down and we built onto her school. We built desks for her. We, we brought food and resources. And on our first trip down... Um, they said, do you want to see the hole? And we said, what is the hole? And they said, well, it's the poorest part of town. See, they, they dug this huge hole in the middle of town, and they use it as a landfill, and they dump all the trash from the city in there, and the poorest of the poor live in the hole. And they make homes out of the trash, and they try and recycle things out of the trash to survive, and people buy stuff from them. And... They said, okay, well, let's, let's go see the hole. And so this is part of our group standing up at the top and then th from the bottom. This hole is about 50 feet deep. And so we started walking through there. And, uh, next picture. Um, and, and this is what you see just, and it's hard to see. I know this is black and white. My, I had to have my dad take a picture. Uh, he has the pictures up on his wall at home, and he, he sent them to me. Um, but this is basically, as you're climbing down, you can just see parts of a car and trash and, and the little homes that they've built um, and structures, and we start climbing down. And then next picture. Um, and so we, we walk through, and we get to see uh, families. Um, the, the water that they have was literally a creek this wide that went just through the middle of all the garbage, and the kids were drinking out of that. Um, next picture. This was what was unbelievable. As, I, 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 as a high school kid, um, and there were high school kids and adults on this trip, most of us left in tears because it was so hard to see the poverty that we saw. And, and what was amazing was our entire time walking down there, the kids were smiling and laughing and playing and joyous. And, and we had things to give them and, and they, didn't even take them. They just kept playing with what they were playing with. They were content. They were happy with what they had. And as we went back to the hotel that night, um, that was what moved us the most, was there was not one of us that would be happy if we were them. There was not one of us that would ever smile. We would be the most miserable person ever if we had to be in their shoes. But how were they joyous? How did they have that, that joy and that, that just overwhelming sense of a life that's worth living when we look at it and go, that's not worth living at all. I would rather be dead than live that life. And that hit us all. And here's where we're going today is a lot of times when we think about God, we measure if God is blessing us by how we are doing financially. A lot of us do this. 
And, and the truth is, is if I were to ask you, is God blessing you right now? You would look, one of the major places you would look is your finances. And you would go, well, you know, I can't pay all my bills. And, you know, I got this and we owe on this and we do this. And, and what's interesting is when things are not good financially, we think God is not blessing us. We say, well, you know what? Things are really tight. Things are awful. No, I don't think God's blessing me. Or if all of a sudden we're getting promotions and, and we got more money and we got more things and we can buy this and we can buy this and we can go on this vacation, then yeah, God's blessing me. And a lot of times that's how we measure things. But what's interesting is what we're going to do for the next eight weeks is we're going to look at a famous sermon of Jesus. It's not the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is, is recorded in the book of Matthew. This is a different sermon that's recorded in the book of Luke, and it says that it was on a level place, a plain, and it's known as the, the Sermon on the Plain. Um, and so uh, Jesus is going to lay this out in, in Luke chapter 6, and he makes eight very valid points that are going to shape how we look at the world. And so the first point that he makes is this, and you have it on the your back of your bulletin and you have it on the screen here. He says this to the disciples. Um, he, it's interesting, this is right after he has gathered the disciples to him, and now this is his, his teaching to them. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as backwards. Anybody else? That Jesus would say, blessed are the ones who got nothing. Blessed are those who are destitute, poor, poverty, and woe, basically warning to all you who are rich because you're getting your comfort now. And some of us would step back and we'd say, oh, well, maybe Jesus misspoke. I know I, as a pastor, do it all the time. There's times I'm up here talking and all of a sudden your faces go, and I, I always look at my wife because she's always the good barometer and she'll go, reverse that. And I'm like, ah, oh, I messed up again. I, I, I know I misspeak all the time. Maybe Jesus misspoke, right? Maybe he got this backwards because there's no way that can be true. Is there? Is there any way that statement can be true? Does your heart really believe that? And what's interesting about this is Jesus meant it. And I think we as Western American Christians today, we need to wrestle with what this means. What does this mean? Does this mean that all of us should sell all our stuff and go live on the streets? No. But what truth is Jesus trying to teach us? And I think the truth is very simple. Your financial circumstances, good or bad, do not tell you that God loves you. Did you hear me on that? Your financial circumstances, whether they are good or bad, do not tell you whether God loves you. God already loves you. So what are we to learn from a statement like this? And, and I think there's four big things that we can learn from a statement like this. How does this all work? How does being poor something that's a blessing? And how is being rich something that's a warning? Here's the four things that we can learn. And the first one is this. Money distracts us from the purpose of this life. Money distracts us from the purpose of this life. See, sometimes what happens is, uh, it's interesting, um, Jesus talked more about money than almost any other issue. Why do you think that is? Why do you think Jesus focused so much on money? Because money can replace the purpose that God gives us for our lives. We can get skewed to where we believe that getting money, saving money, earning money, striving for money is the purpose of our life. And what's interesting is what we learn in the Bible is this, that God saves us from sin, death, and the devil. And we, we as Lutherans, we say that all the time. We, we teach that all the time. God saves us from sin. He saves us from death. And he saves us from the devil. But do we ever really focus a lot on what he saves us for? He saves us from those things, but what does he save us for? What is the purpose of our lives now that we are saved? And the purpose for our lives is to serve him and his mission. That the purpose of our lives is not to be aimed at money or status or power or any of those things. That the purpose of our lives is to be aimed at his mission and his purpose. 
And here's the funny thing about the poor, is that the poor know something that the rich will never know. The poor know something that the rich will never know, and it's this, that this life is about more than wealth. I looked at kids in the absolute hell of a life that I would never wish upon anybody, that were joyous, that knew their God and loved their God. And I think if I was in their shoes, I would hate God. Why would he do this to me? I I would resent God. But they had joy because they learned something that nobody else would know unless they were in their shoes, that this life is about more than wealth. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves is this, what are you serving? What is your life built around? Is your life built around saving so that you can reach this goal, uh, putting away this so that you can hit this type of retirement, trying to earn this so that you can live this type of life, trying to strive and do everything, spending all your time, energy, forsaking your family, forsaking this, forsaking this, because you're trying to hit some mark in your bank account? Is that really what life should be about? Or is life about something more? You see, the poor understand this. The life is about more. There are other things like family, like God, that matter. The second thing that I, I think we can learn from this, how, how is someone who is poor living a blessed life and someone who is rich living a life of warning is this, is that when we are in poverty, we learn to trust him. When we are in poverty, we learn to trust him. You see, the Bible tells us something very simple, and yet we mess it up all the time. The Bible tells us that God gives us what we need. The Bible tells us God gives us what we need, and that we need to trust him. That we get what we, what is the word? Need. And what is the word that we constantly struggle with? What we want. But see, those that are in poverty understand that God gives them what they need, that he can be trusted, that a meal might not come every day, but they are going to be taken care of. And God tells us this very simply, and we get this. Uh, We understand that our relationship is that he is our father and we are the children. How many of you have ever been around children in a toy store? Anybody? Yeah. What is the most common phrase you hear? I want that or this. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is as a parent, we don't look at them and say, no, you don't want that. What is our response? You don't need that. We're not going to try and argue with them that they don't want it because we know they want it. We argue with them that they don't need it. And in the same way, God does the same with us. God, as we sit there and in poverty, we we recognize, you know what? I have what I need. I have air in my lungs. I I have a roof over my head. I have the things that I need. Do I have the things I want? No, not necessarily. And, And what we understand about God is this, that he provides. He tells us not to be anxious. He says, look at the birds of the air. He says, they don't store away things. They don't have little houses and stack up all their their food. They are provided for by me and I take care of all of them. All of the birds of the, think how many birds there are in the world. Stop and think about that first. Just think how many birds there are in Omaha. How many birds every day that you you see flying around, God is feeding them every day. Now multiply that throughout the whole world. God has all that in his hands. He's taking care of all that. And he says, I love you a lot more than I love birds. I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to give you what you need. But that's the battle. You see, the more that we we want and want and want, the more that we have and we want more and more, the more we battle with this. And we say, well, you know what? He's not providing me enough. Well, is he not providing you enough for your wants or for your needs? Because the truth is he's giving you what you need. And maybe he loves you so much that he's not giving you more because you don't have the self-control to handle it. I, taught, I said that at the, the end of a sermon a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know that I should not be somebody that God blesses with like a lottery winning. I would be terrible. I would not be able, that would be the end of me. I would not be able to be the person I'm called to be. If I had millions of dollars, I would not handle it the right way. God lovingly says, no, 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 Justin, you, you take this and you just do, do with it as you know you should. You don't need this. 
And that's the truth. Sometimes we say, well, God, I want this, and I want this, and I want this. And he's saying, you can't handle that. That would ruin you. So trust me that I'm giving you what you need. And, and the truth is, is what we have to understand about God's provision is this. God's provision is this. It's that he doesn't matter how much he gives you. He's giving you what you need. He's giving you what you need. The third thing that we learn is this. We learn our need for him. When the poor and the destitute and the desperate are in need, they face um, the reality that they need something bigger and more powerful to provide for them. That they are helpless and that drives them to be dependent on God. Totally dependent on God. If you woke up this morning with no food in your house, no food, money in your wallet, what would you do? Well, I can tell you what most of us would do. We would look to God and say, God, provide for me. I'm dependent on you. Help me. There is that understanding of the relationship. And this is the problem with the rich. It is, as Jesus says, not me, Jesus says, is that they are, they are already receiving their comfort. They are every bit as spiritually in need as the poor person, yet they are so insulated by their wealth that things that would make them aware of their, God's need aren't around them. Does that make sense? They're so insulated that they don't see their need for God. And so that's why God, Jesus is saying, warning to you that are rich, that say, well, you know what? I can take care of myself. I don't need him. I just need him for this, this, and this. I don't need him for everything. Whereas the poor, those in poverty see, I need him for everything. And the hardest thing that we have to realize is this, is that money can't fix everything. We believe it. There was a, a study done, it was unbelievable. There was a study done and they, they asked, um, uh, would having more money help your life? How, throw out a percentage you think of Americans that said yes. 87. <laughs> it was 93%. 93% of people said, yes, more money would help my life. How many of you today, if we're being honest, would say a little bit more money would help my life? Yeah, we believe that. We believe that a little bit more money would actually fix some things. But you know what the old adage says? Money can't buy happiness. There are actually a lot of things that money can't do. But the sad reality is, is that many of us think more money will fix things that we need money, and we place this hope in money. If I just get a little bit more money, it'll fix this. If I get a little more money, it'll do this for me. It'll help this. But here's the thing. Money can't save you. Money is not your savior. Only Jesus is. But sometimes we think a little bit more money. You know what? I could put it away. I could take care of my health. I could take care of my house. I could take care of my future. I could take care of this. Do you really have control over those things? Can you really stop natural disasters from happening? Can you really keep yourself healthy? Can you really take care of everything that happens? No. But money teases us and lets us believe that. And the last thing that we learn is this. We learn the importance of giving to him. When you are the recipient of charity and grace, you learn how important people being generous is. When the only meal that you get is because someone has donated or given their time or their efforts or their resources to feed you, you understand how important it is to be generous with what you have. And it's interesting, uh, Psalm 24, 1 says this, and the, the earth and everything in it belong to God. And what's interesting about that is that includes your money. And so as we look at this, God says, you know what? I give you everything you need financially. I give you all of your money. And this is what God says. I want you to be generous in return. I want you to give back to me to support the ministries that are going on in your community, in your church, and elsewhere. And what happens is we get very possessive over our money. We say, that's my money. I earned that money. That's in my bank account. Whose name is on that check? Mine. That's my money. And what the, those in poverty understand is God calls us to be generous, and they understand the importance of that generosity. See, here's the thing. God calls every single one of you to serve him to feed the hungry, to clothe the poor, to house the orphans and the widows, to tend to the sick, to mourn with those who mourn, and to take care of this community. How many of you have a plan to accomplish all those things? Raise your hand. How many of you have your plan in place so that you can accomplish every single one of those things? 
Yeah, that's the point is that we don't have the ability to do all of this. And that's why God looks at you and he says, give back to your church, give back to the community organizations, give them a portion. He talks about a 10th, give them a 10th, a tithe of what you have. You get to keep 90, 10 comes back to me. That's whose money? God's money that he has entrusted to you and he can give you as little or as much as he wants. And he says, give back to me. You know, um, sometimes we confuse that with thinking, you know what, if I write the check and walk away, then I'm checking the box off the list. But the, the truth is, is God wants you to be involved in it too. But you have to understand you can't do it all. But there are organizations and there are people that are devoting their life to it that need Christians to step up and support them. It was interesting, there was a study, and I've, I, I repeat this all the time because it just blows my mind. They got all of the, the world hunger food organizations together that feed people throughout the world, and they said, how much would it cost per year to feed everybody? If all of you reached everybody, what would be the cost? And they said it was about $30 billion a year is what it would take to feed the entire world. $30 billion a year, which is what Americans alone spend on ice cream. What Americans alone spend on ice cream. If we took the money that we spent on ice cream and we devoted it instead to feeding the whole world, we could do it. This is my point, that God has provided all that is needed to take care of the world. Christians just need to step up and do their part. If we would understand that, you know what, I can't, I can't help every addict, I can't help every hungry person, I can't help everybody that's in a mental instability, but I can support those who can. And I can put the resources in place to help them. And so when we talk about tithing, you know what, your tithe is between you and God. I don't ever, hear me on this, I as the pastor of this church, I don't ever look at what you give. There's one guy who does it. And you know what? He doesn't even care because he has to put all those little letters in all the envelopes and he just wants to be done with it once a year. He just puts them all in and sends them. Nobody checks. Do you know why? Because I don't care. That's between you and God. God says, I give you this. You honor me with it and give back to me. And here's the thing. He says, give it to him. That means if you have some organization that tugs at your heart and you want to give to that, give to it. If you, have, you want to give here, give here. We'll make do with whatever we get. But understand the role that we play. My salary comes from who? You guys. You pay me to take care of the spiritual needs of this community. When one of you has a loss, when one of you calls and says, hey, my son is in a, a rough spot, addiction, can you help with this? Can you, can you guide this person here? Can you do these things? That's what I'm here to do. I devote my life to serving the spiritual needs of this community. And you all put the bread on my table. And you all support the person that's down there working at the methadone clinic. You support the person that's down there putting food on the table for the hundreds of families in this community. That's what we understand. Is those in poverty understand the importance of giving to God. And so here's a summary of where we're at. Blessed are the poor who do not have to face the temptations that the rich have to face. And warning to the rich who are playing with fire. Don't let money be what you strive for. Don't let money be what you're all about. And understand that God gives it to you and he wants you to use it in a powerful way. And so as we shift into a time of confession, this is my hope. Um, I'm going to put three phrases up on the screen. And my hope is that we can say them together and we can pray them to God together. And the first one is this. God, I need you, not money. Can we pray this together right now? As we, as we fold our hands and you'll have to still look at the screen. But this is my hope is that we can learn these lessons. And the first one is this. Can we say it together? God, I need you, not money. God is what you need. Money will not fix things. Money will not change things. God changes things. God fixes things. And God gives you all you need, and he will provide for you. The second one is this. 
God, I trust you, not money. Can we say that together? God, I trust you, not money. Do you understand that? That your hope is found in him? Not in some coming promotion, not in some retirement fund. Your hope is found in him. And let's say this third one. God, I love you and not money. Can we say it together? God, I love you and not money. Do you understand that you can be in the worst poverty in the world and you still have the hope of an eternity to come with every splendor, every wonder, every graciousness and love because of Jesus? Money you don't take with you. God is eternal. Love him above all else. Build your life around him. Strive for him. Let's go into a time of confession now. Heavenly Father, where there is a separation between these things, where we love or trust or, or strive for money instead of you, convict us. And Lord, all the other things that we've done, we ask you to, to show us now and to convict us so that we can, we can repent of them now. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we confess that we are sinners. We are in need of your forgiveness. We have, we have trusted in things we shouldn't have trusted in. We have put our hopes in things that we shouldn't have put our hope in. We have strived for things that are so far away from the things that we should strive for. Lord, over these next eight weeks, shape our hearts and our minds. Mold us, Lord. Teach us the truth. That it's not money that saves, it's you. And convict us and change our hearts from where we need to learn that. And all this we lift up in your holy name. Amen. Are you a sinner in need of forgiveness? And say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Well, I got good news for you. Jesus came and he paid your sins already. Your punishment is already paid for. And all that's left is redemption where God gets to look at you and say, forgiven my child, forgiven my son, forgiven my daughter. I love you, welcome back. God loves you so much that he took the sins that you committed and the punishment for those sins and he put them on his son, Jesus, and he killed him on the cross to set you free. And so as a pastor, I get to tell you the best news in the whole world, that your sins have been forgiven, completely, wholeheartedly gone in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.